His name is a name that is above every other name, and his name is a name that heals us, frees us, and cleanses us. I want to ask everybody to stand, if you're not standing already, just to honor the gift that God has placed in our midst tonight. We have a gentleman here tonight who's become a really good friend of mine and my wife. Most of you know, about a year ago, the Lord connected us with the Church of the Highlands, and Pastor Chris Hodges and Tammy Hodges became our pastors, and have really filled a void in our lives that uh, I didn't speak much about a certain level of emptiness that I'd had, but God used them to really pour into us in a way that we really needed. Not only that, but God has used them as well as a church to really pour into us and sow some things into us. And one of the things I'm really impressed about, about uh, Pastor Lane, who's, uh, Lane Strange who's going to minister to us tonight, is not his teaching ability and preaching ability. That'll be evident tonight as he shares what's in his heart. But Church of the Highlands has been around for 16 years and has about 40 plus thousand people that attend every weekend. And this man has been there with Pastor Chris Hodges as his associate from the very first day. In fact, 12 years before they started the church, Pastor Chris Hodges was his youth pastor back in Colorado. And so he's been, they've been together for 28 years, right on his hip, serving this man of God, helping this man of God. And I can tell you, I've been around him. He could go out at any time and start a church, pass a church, and would do a phenomenal job. But a phenomenal job on the earth that doesn't count in heaven really doesn't matter. And so the great honor that I have for this man of God is not only is he a great minister, but he's someone who's been loyal to his pastor. And there's something else a lot of folks may not know about him I'm going to share with you. He's also a professional race car driver. Proving that you can do the gospel ministry and the thing you just love to do at the same time. And God will let you do both of them well. So I'm going to ask you, he's over the Grow Network, which is all the different uh, churches, our churches like ours that come to, to glean from them. He's over all 16 of the campuses that they have connected to Church of the Highlands. I want to ask you to put your hands together and give a huge impact church welcome to Lane Trent tonight, my friend. <laughs> hey, uh, I really appreciate that, and, uh, and, uh, but I'm fully aware you've never seen me before, never heard my name, uh, and so I would love it if you would give a bigger welcome to Jesus. Why don't you give him the best welcome of the night? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right, you, you may be seated. Uh, what a huge privilege it is uh, for me to be here. So I extend greetings to all of you uh, from my pastor, from Chris Hodges, from your pastor's pastor, Chris Hodges. Uh, he extends his love to you tonight by sending me uh, to be with you. And it, it has been an honor to be at Highlands for the last 16 years. Pastor, I believe it's, it's better to serve in the right house than lead a house you were never called to lead. And, uh, and so if there's any message I would ever want to communicate to pastors, those that were ordained tonight and any of you that are pastors here, is, is don't always aspire to doing your own thing. Uh, but God can use you in a great way where you are. And, and we've got to be careful with those aspirations and make sure that it's not our pride rather than God's calling. And so I'm just honored to serve my pastor, Pastor Chris, uh, at Church of the Highlands. And uh, it's really cool because I get to do stuff like this and come hang out with our extended family. And uh, if, there's anything, if there's anything I know about real relationships, true relationships, is that when you really love somebody, you automatically love who they love. And so I, I deeply uh, love your pastors. I mean, they are... Uh, quick friends. I mean, divine flow, connection, friendship. Like, like sometimes you just meet people and you just fall in love with them and you're like, we're going to be friends the rest of our lives. But I know that they love their kids and, and the way they love their kids. And then, and then of course, Kerrigan, the way we've been praying for you, girl. Um, but because I love mom and dad, I love her. Right? Right? So I, I just want you guys to know, even though I'm a stranger here, I feel at home because I love your pastors, but also because I love them. Let me tell you something. The way they love their kids is how they love you. And, and I hear how they talk about how much they love you when they're not here. And isn't it nice when somebody that's not around you is talking about you and how much they love you? Because your pastors love you, I automatically love you whether you're okay with it or not. 
And so I, I hope you're okay with it because I feel at home here at Impact Church and uh, honored to be here. And, I, and I, a little extra fun, like, side note, or another reason I love this church is uh, they, pa- they planted this church the year I got married. I've been married to my wife, Rachel, for 21 years. I would, I would love it if you would honor your pastors for their sacrifice for the last 21 years. Absolutely. Yes. Give them the honor that they are due. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of all of them and those that aren't here, thank you. We honor you. 21 years. That's awesome. Absolutely fantastic. I married a girl. I I did grow up in Colorado. It's uh, pastor said, and so I uh, uh, was a 17-year-old in high school, loved God, but hated church. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows what that's like. Uh, it's not a fun place to be, and I, I walked into a youth group. Pastor Chris was the youth pastor, and for the first time, I met teenagers that loved God and loved church, and my life was radically transformed. Uh, many years later, uh, I met a girl in Mississippi, and I married my wife, Rachel, uh, in 1996. I have a picture of my wife and my two daughters, Ashlyn and Devin. And of course, uh, there's no way to tell which one is which, right? You wouldn't know which one is my wife. Uh, She is on the left. Uh, My oldest, Ashlyn, is on the right. Uh, Ashlyn is a special miracle to us. We adopted her the day she was born in Kansas. Uh, They even gave us our own hospital room. She spent her first night in a hospital room with us and uh, has been with us. She'll be 18 in October. And then Devin uh, is in the middle, and she's also a miracle uh, because we we could not have children of our own. Uh, And then through uh, the gift of in vitro, uh, she is an in vitro baby, and so uh, uh, we are thankful for her as well. So those are my miracles, my family. And uh, I usually travel with my oldest daughter, uh, but she has a babysitting job this week. She's like, Dad, I have to work. All right. And so I, I, I brought somebody else with me. Uh, he's, he's, he is definitely not my daughter. It is Pastor Stephen Winston. Stand up, Stephen, so they can see you. Uh, Pastor Stephen pastors our newest campus at Church of the Highlands in McCalla, Alabama. And uh, he was working for the power company, and God called him to be a part of our church. And uh, he's doing an incredible job, and he is my travel partner on this trip. But uh, the reason I'm here is to share God's word with you. I, w- I would love if you would turn in your scriptures to my, really my favorite section of scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. While you're turning there, I want to ask you a question, and, and that is, and I think the, the people that were up here at the front uh, a little bit ago would answer yes to this. Have you ever been asked to, some, asked to do something that you weren't ready for? Oh, yeah. Like, just think about that for a minute. What are the things in your life that you were asked to do or, or maybe forced to do and you felt completely unprepared? I'm not ready for that. My first memory of that is my first day of kindergarten. I vividly remember outside of Rudy Elementary School, maybe I was about this tall, and I had my arm around my mama's leg, my thumb in my mouth, tears rolling down my face. I don't want to go. Don't make me go. Yes, I was sucking my thumb in kindergarten, okay? I was not ready for it. But how many of you know, whether I was ready or not, I needed to go? Same thing happened in junior high without the thumb sucking. I did not want to go to my first day in junior high school. It was a new school, no friends, didn't know anybody. I was terrified out of my pre-adolescent mind. I mean, that was a scary day. But don't you know that it was important that I, that I went to junior high school? How about, uh, how about your first job, first day at work? Like, you feel unprepared. I don't, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm ready for this. I'm not qualified for this. And we, we tend to make up excuses, right, why we can't take that. How about, how about my wedding day? My goodness. All of a sudden, you realize what's about to happen. Oh, Lord Jesus, what have I done? What have I gotten myself into? Can I really walk down that, that aisle or walk up to that altar and stand there and watch my wife walk down that aisle? I mean, am I really ready? I mean, terrified. Really, if my mom would have been up there, I probably would have started sucking my thumb, grabbing onto her, like, <laughs> like oh my goodness. So many things in life that we, we, we're not ready for, that there's so much goodness on the other side. 
And I think a lot of us, that that happens to us in our walk with God. Or maybe it's even prevented us from having a walk with God. Because we just feel like we're not ready. And so we make the excuses. I'll tell more about this story later, but, but I, I went skydiving one time. I wasn't ready for that. But I'll give you some more details about that in a minute. But there's just certain things that, that we can experience if we'll just be willing to overcome the excuses that we make when we're, we're not ready. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll start in verse 17. This is what I call a refrigerator verse. You, you might know this uh, verse. I call it a refrigerator verse because this is something that you would want to write down and stick it on the refrigerator or maybe the mirror in the bathroom or on the dashboard of your car. Everybody loves verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Yes, that's good news. We're fired up about that. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And whoa, 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 put on the brakes. I'm not ready for this. Wait a minute. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Time out, God. I like the new creation stuff. I'm ready to, I'm ready to have the old go away and the new come, but I'm not ready for ministry. I know who I am. I know what I've done. I know where I've been. And I am definitely not ready for ministry. I mean, how many of us would feel that way? Like, 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 like we're ready for the salvation, but are we really ready for the assignment? And I would be honest with you, I don't, I don't know that many times in my life that I was actually ready. I was terrified. I was called into ministry that summer after I went into Pastor Chris's youth group, 17 years old before my senior year. But then it's like, how is that going to happen? What, what, what really does that look like? How can I do that? I'm not, I'm not really ready for that. And I started to make excuses because I, I, I'm just, I just can't, can't go there. I, I worked in the towing and recovery business in my dad's company uh, for 12 years after school. And so when God calls me to go to Birmingham and help Pastor Chris start a church, I definitely started making some excuses. I'm like, wait a minute, God, I'm a tow truck driver. I know you called me into ministry when I was 17. I've read this scripture before, but I'm not ready. And how many times do we, do we make excuses and, we, and we, we prevent God from doing something great in our life because we feel like we're not ready? Let's continue on in verse 19. That here, here we're given the ministry of reconciliation, that God was rec reconciling the world to himself in Christ Ooh, nice, nice little good news right here. I think he's trying to encourage us. Not counting men's sins against them. Does anybody know that's good right there? And, oh no, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Okay, so now all of a sudden I'm given the ministry and the message. We are therefore, oh no, Christ's ambassadors. Why are we his ambassadors? As though God were making his appeal through us. I don't know about you, but this is a little intimidating. This is a little bit scary. I like the new creation stuff, but I don't know if I'm ready to be the minister, the messenger, and the ambassador. I got some stuff I got to work out. I've got some excuses that will, will keep me where I am until that time where, I, where I'm ready. The problem is, he needs us to be him for them. The only way that God can move on planet earth is through people. Not through churches. This building is not the sanctuary. No, you are the sanctuary. Under the new covenant, Jesus uses people to touch people, to reach people. We then have to be his ambassadors, his messengers, his ministers. It's like, wait a minute, I, I didn't go to Bible college. Oh, wait a minute, I still got some, some issues I'm dealing with. Well, if we go back to the scripture, I, 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 I missed the verse that said, all of this is from God. Go to college, get an MDiv, Get ordained. Is that in there? It's not in there. When you are in Christ, 
you're a new creation. Guess when the assignment begins? At salvation. Oh. Thanks for the encouragement, Lane. Please don't come back. Stay in Birmingham. Well, this freaks me out. I'm a tow truck driver. God, what are you, what are you doing calling me to go to Birmingham? I've got a, I've got a lot of excuses. I've got, a, I've got a, le- a lot of reasons why I can't be a minister, a messenger, ambassador for you. The reality is the space between where you are and gar- where God wants you to be can be very intimidating. It can be very scary. And oftentimes it can feel absolutely impossible. But that's actually how God likes it. I think he loves it when we are in a place of dependence on him. He loves it when we're in a place where we're we're like, we can't do this. I can't do this, God. I, I can't do it on my own. God uses the most unlikely candidates to do the greatest things. And so I want to I want to share some scripture and I want to I want to vol- my, volunteer myself as the tow truck driver from Colorado as an unlikely candidate that God would do anything through, okay, to hopefully encourage you that that you don't have to wait any longer. That the excuses don't have to be there anymore. That even though you don't want to go to kindergarten or junior high school or get married or go into ministry or jump out of a plane, whatever, whatever you don't want to do, I want to encourage you tonight that that can change right now. You know the story probably. Most of you have heard it. It's the story of Jesus walking on water. Matthew chapter 14, if you want to go there, I'll read uh, verses 24 through 32. I want you to get the full context of this story, though, because to me, I learned this story in Sunday school. I, I, I was raised in church. Remember, I love God. I didn't like church. I was raised in church, and this story looked like this. It was, it was a, and, and this is going to date some of us in the room, but it was, it was, it was told with a flannel graph. So you got to be over like 35 to laugh at that. Everybody else is like, what is he talking about? A flannel graph, is, is, it's, it's felt board, and then we had characters, right? So you had the boat, like you stuck the boat on the board. You, you know what I'm talking about? And then, and then you had the disciples, right? So you stuck them on the, on the boat. But the, but the disciples were the same size as the boat. So you had these 12 disciples. All, like, why didn't we ever make the boat big enough? For the 12 disciples. So they're in this boat, hanging out of this boat, and then there was usually a bird. Those were easy to make. It was just like this, right? So there was a bird in the sky, and you would use about 100 birds down to make the waves, right? So you had a bird in the sky and the waves. Here's the picture. And then you had Jesus in his white robe, walking on the waves, smiling, (laughs) waving. That's the story that I knew. And that's the way I believe that it played out, right? Well, let's, let's read the facts. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About 3 o'clock in the morning, uh-oh, have you ever been on the water, in the ocean, or over in the river in the middle of the night when there was a storm, there's no starlight, no moonlight? I've been out on a lake in Colorado in the middle of the night with no starlight, and I am terrified. The water looks like the abyss. You can't see your hand in front of your face. There in a storm, this is not a flannel graph story. This is a terrifying moment for these disciples, even terrifying for the ones in the boat that that were accustomed to being on the water, especially Peter. He was a fisherman. This was not something new for him, but, but, but this was a bad situation at three in the morning. And then Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. Think of your scariest moment in your life. Maybe the first time you were left at home alone and the water heater was making noise and you thought it was a burglar. You know what I'm talking about. Like, you're terrified, right? In, go to your scariest moment. In your scariest moment, do you want to see some guy walking on water? No. The last thing I want to see when I am afraid is a ghost. So it went from bad to worse for these guys. 
They are absolutely terrified out of their mind. They probably think their lives are going to end. But then Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and waves... He was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When, they climbed back, when he climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You are really the Son of God, they exclaimed. And so here's this terrifying situation where all of us might be. This calling, this assignment... An ambassador, a minister, a messenger, God, I'm not ready. I'm terrified. I'm I'm going to stay in the boat. And so we make excuses. The first excuse that we'll make is we're afraid. So many of us, that's our number one excuse. It's just fear. I'm afraid. As we read in verse 26, they were terrified. See, the devil paralyzes with fear, but God empowers us with faith. See, we've got to have something to combat that fear in our life. The the, the world we live in wants facts. Right? What are are the facts of the situation? It's a bad storm. Those are the facts. But God doesn't need facts. He wants faith. He's not worried about the facts. And so we've got to combat that that fear. And here's, here's, here's something that's so important. I want to make sure you get it. If God was going to ask you to do something easy, you'd do it without him. See, I don't think being his ambassador is easy or his messenger or his minister. That freaks me out. That's a lot of pressure, right? And so he wouldn't ask me to do something easy or I'd just do it without him. So if I'm going to be his ambassador, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to conquer my fear with faith and be willing to do what Peter did, right? Jump out of the boat in that, in that moment. What's the next excuse that, that comes to us? And, and, and in my mind, I know there's lots of excuses. I'm just giving you my excuses. Really, the next one for me, which probably would have applied to Peter, I'm not talented enough. How many times do we say that? Oh, I, I don't have the talent to do ministry. I, I mean, my goodness. This worship team? I can't play instruments like that. I can't sing like that. Golly, the worship here is so good, Bishop. Like, I think when, when we get to heaven, you guys are going to be wanting, hey, can we go back to church on Sunday for worship? Just a little bit, guy. But that intimidates us, right? And we start comparing. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lord, for social media so we can compare all the time. Oh, I, I can't, I don't have the talent to be a good small group leader. When I go over to Jim's house, when he puts Doritos in a bowl, it looks better than if I put Doritos in a bowl. I don't have small group leadership talent. I mean, my goodness, when Pastor Damon reads the scriptures, it sounds like it's like a movie star. I mean, no joke. I mean, his voice, I'm riding in the car with him today. I think I'm riding with Morpheus. It's like, whoa, whoa. I mean, he's got a Hollywood voice. And that can be, that can be intimidating. Like, I don't sound like that. I don't have ministry talent. I don't have that. I didn't get that gift. And then all of a sudden, that's an excuse that stops us in our tracks. Guess what? I can assure you, Peter did not have water walking talent. He didn't. Of anybody in the boat, who would know what would sink and what would float? The fisherman. He didn't have the talent, yet he was willing to overcome his fear and his excuse of no talent and walk by faith, right, and jump out of the boat. Jesus said, come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Jesus just said, you take what you know how to do, and I'm going to yank you out of it. And I'm going to make you do something that you don't know how to do. They know how to fish for fish. They don't know how to fish for men. So Jesus is willing, and he's he's believing in them enough to say, look, you can can do this. I like to say that God uses willingness more than talent. 
I believe I'm proof of it. I'm a tow truck driver preaching to you tonight. No offense to the tow truck drivers, but that's what I was good at. I'm a mechanic. My dad started the business when I was two years old. I grew up in the tow truck. He'd get me up in the middle of the night, three in the morning. You want to go on a call? Yeah. Put me in the truck. I'd just go right to sleep. I don't even know why he would take me on calls. <laughs> this was in the day of bench seats and no seat belts. Anybody remember that? All right. Older people in the crowd. There you go. All right. People, some of the young generation, no seat belts? What? Yeah, like literally, they built vehicles. with. They didn't even have seat belts. All right. Anyways. Whatever you don't have, God will make up the difference. So not having the talent is not a good enough excuse. God will fill in the gap between where your talent ends and his calling begins. He's going to fill that, he's going to fill that gap up. What's the next excuse? This was my excuse because I was in the towing business. You know what, God? Maybe I'm not too afraid to go to Birmingham. Maybe, I'm, maybe, I, maybe I'll get over the fact I don't have the talent to be a pastor. I don't, have, I don't have the abilities to be a pastor. But here's the problem, God. Here's my excuse. I don't have the training. I don't have the training. I've never been to Bible college. I don't have an MDiv. I've never been in an Old Testament survey class or New Testament survey class. I definitely don't know any Greek or Hebrew. I'm not trained enough. So then, therefore, that's my excuse. Well, here's Peter in the boat. Probably could have said the same thing. Jesus just told him to come out and walk on water. He's probably thinking, I haven't been to Water Walking 101 in college. <laughs> like, I've not been trained for this, right? But so many of us use that as an excuse not to do something great for God. And I'm just telling you, it's not about the training. Peter didn't have any. He experienced a miracle when he was willing to jump out of the boat. I love Acts 4.13. Oh, my goodness. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, and this is the religious leaders, okay? This is the, the pastors, the bishops, the, 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 the really, really godly people. When, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary, I qualify, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. The only qualification needed for ministry is Jesus. That's it. Not training. Now, I'm, I might bust your uh, little theological bubbles here. Let's, uh, let's look into the Greek. I don't know the language, but you can look it up and you can study this. Thank, thank God for the internet. The New Testament was written in Greek. So what was the Greek word there? It actually is very easy to translate into English. The Bible scholars said unschooled and ordinary. That was their translation. I think they said that because they didn't want the Bible to be mean or disrespectful to Peter and John. I will give you the Greek word. You figure out what the cor correct English word should have been. The Greek word is idiotos. <laughs> Even a tow truck driver knows what that is. Basically, the religious people said, those guys are idiots. I don't know about you. I qualify for an idiot. If that's all you got to be, I'm in. See, training is not an excuse. You don't have to have more training. My goodness. Studying of many books wearies the body, King Solomon said, right? Like, there is no end. Like, when will you end your training and actually just let God do something through you? Now, I am not saying it's not good to get training. But do not allow a lack of training to be an excuse to not be a minister, an ambassador, a messenger. God qualifies the unqualified. Thank you, Jesus. God qualified a tow truck driver to come to Impact Church. I can't believe I'm standing here. Really. The more he is needed the better the results. You don't need more training. Peter didn't need more training. You just need to jump. Right? It wasn't about his training. He was just willing to jump. I believe that real spiritual growth, real spiritual growth, doesn't happen by listening. It happens by leaping. 
listening to another sermon. They are good here, let me tell you. It's quite intimidating, actually, for me to preach in front of your preacher. Because he's so good. <laughs> but, but you see, we don't need another sermon. We need another step. That's when we really begin to grow. When I was 17 years old, Pastor Chris is like, hey, you want to be a leader? I'm like, yeah, I want to be a leader. I'm called to ministry. He's like, I want you to be my bus pastor. I'm 17 years old, and I'm going to be a pastor? Like, I was sh literally shaking, shaking in my boots. But he gave me a step. He gave me a, an assignment. And I didn't, I didn't grow because of a college course. I grew because I was willing to get on that bus every Wednesday night and pick up teenagers in our city. And he began to train me as a pastor as I rode on that bus, not as I sat in a class. And let me tell you, I'm not against the classroom, but what I'm telling you is those steps are the reason I'm here today. All my ministry growth happened by taking steps, not listening more, learning more. Last excuse I'm going to give you. I think this affects every person in this room. And that's, you know what? Okay, Lane, I'll, I'll go with you. I'll overcome the fear. I, I get I don't need the talent. I, I get I don't need the training, but here's the problem, Lane. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. Because I know me. I know my struggles, my shortcomings, my sin, my temptations. I know me. And therefore, that's my excuse. So I'm going to stop right here. And that's an excuse all of us can make, and it's an excuse that the enemy would love for us to make. I want to tell you, encourage you with this, that Peter many times made lots of mistakes. I don't, I don't know if this is proof or, or, or truth or not, so just this is my opinion. I need to really study it. But I believe there's more documentation of Peter's mistakes than any other disciple. Um, uh, Bishop's nodding, so maybe I'm right. Um, that's cool. Um, <laughs> But I think, but I think that's I think that's God showing us something. Because Peter makes all these mistakes. Peter, Peter absolutely blew it one time. Like he blew it. We read this in Matthew 16, 23. This is how bad Peter messed up. Jesus turned to him and said, Get behind me, Satan. Is the youth pastor in here? Or is there a, who's a pastor here? Somebody. Is anybody? You're a pastor here. What's your name? Okay, Rodney. The day that Bishop tells you you're the devil is a bad day. <laughs> you know you messed up. Like, can you imagine? Jesus called him the devil. That's what a mess he was. So Peter, being the mess that he was, is the same guy that Jesus said, you know what, Peter, on you, I'm going to build my church. You're going to preach the first message after I go to heaven. Peter, the fisherman, had all the excuses. Definitely one, hey, I'm not good enough. See, but God wants your trust more than he wants your perfection. That's all he needs. Peter didn't have to be perfect to walk on water because he couldn't have been perfect, right? No person, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is good enough in themselves. It wasn't his perfection that held him up on the water. It was Jesus that held him up on the water. So we can take that step of faith even when we are flawed in ourselves, even when we are not perfect in of ourselves. Remember our opening scriptures. He doesn't count our sins against us. He didn't call Peter out of the boat and been like, oh, wait a minute. Peter, the other day, you really messed up. Stay in the boat. He didn't count his sins against him. God's miracle in our life is going to require us to jump. It's just going to require it. So back to the skydiving. I was leading a small group. I was 20 years old. My co-leader, her name was Janae, her and her fiancé went skydiving. And they came back to the group the next Friday night. We had a Friday night high school small group. And they were bragging about their skydiving experience. And all these high school kids who I'm their leader are like, Lane, why didn't you go? <laughs> so 
So I'm 20 years old. I've got a good deal of pride. And I will admit to you enough male chauvinistic pride that if my co-leader, Janae, jumped out of an airplane, of course I will go. So I probably made up some lame excuse like, well, they didn't ask me. So then, of course, in front of everybody, they said, well, why don't you go with us next weekend? In my male chauvinistic pride, I was like, all right, I'm there. Bring it on. There's two ways to go skydiving. I'm going to show you a picture of the, of the most common way to go skydiving. So take a look at this picture. Uh, it's called tandem. Tandem skydiving is when you strap yourself. Remember, you're not talented. <laughs> you're afraid. <laughs> you don't have the training. I'm definitely not worthy. <laughs> you strap yourself to a professional. See, the professional has thousands of jumps. They know what to do when something goes wrong. If you ever go skydiving, I recommend you go tandem. <laughs> Janae did not go tandem. Janae did something called static line. Static line skydiving is when the first time you leave the airplane, you're actually by yourself. Brilliant. I would advocate that it should be illegal. <laughs> they should not, you should, that should be completely illegal in the United States of America. So Lane, how can you really justify jumping out of a plane? Okay, so all of the same excuses. First of all, I'm afraid. Second of all, I don't have skydiving talent. Third of all, I don't have the training. They're like, oh, we'll take care of that. We're going to show you some videos for a few hours to train you. Guess what the videos are of? Everything that can go wrong with a parachute. <laughs> That's awesome. Hours of different scenarios of problems with parachutes and how to solve the problem while you're falling from the sky. The problem is as I'm watching the videos, I'm getting more and more terrified, and I can't remember the last video, which makes me more terrified. So I go into this kind of just terrified daze. I can't remember anything. I mean, they're giving you all these instructions. Like, and the last instruction is, if something goes wrong that you cannot fix, you have to break loose of that parachute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, then what? Wait a few seconds. And then open up your reserve. Oh, good, I have a reserve. That's awesome. There's two parachutes. It's fantastic. Here's the problem. In the videos, they're explaining to you that you have to make sure you pull the bad parachute first before you pull the reserve. What if you get that mixed up? Like, if, <laughs> like, like I'm falling from the sky, my parachute's all messed up, and I pulled the wrong one. Oh, then your reserve will open up into the bad parachute, and they're both bad, and you hit the ground. Now I've forgotten all the videos, and I can't remember, do I pull left first or right first? And they gave you some little riddle or rhyme or something to remember which one, and I couldn't remember which one. So it's finally time to go to the plane after a couple hours of training. This is awesome. When you don't want to do this, you kind of drag your feet, right? So I have my parachute on my back. I'm dragging my feet to the plane. Yeah, that wasn't very good, because guess what? When you're the last one on... Your church is so brilliant. <laughs> okay, this is not a big, beautiful airplane. We're, we're, this is a dirt runway, people. This is in, in eastern Colorado. The Rockies are off to the, to the west. We're on a dirt runway in a rickety old airplane. They don't care about the airplane because everybody's got a parachute. <laughs> so this thing is a piece of junk. We get in the plane. They shut the door. There's no seats in the plane. I'm sitting next to the door. And up until this point, I have covered my fear. Like, I've acted cool all day. All day long, I've acted cool. So Janae's thinking, Lane's such a stud. He's so cool. He's not even afraid. We take off. We get up to 10,000 feet. I'm still covering my fear. On the inside, I'm terrified. But then something happened that I've never experienced in any aircraft in my life. They open the door. <laughs> I cannot cover it anymore. <laughs> Not only Janae, but the other 20 people in the airplane are doing exactly what you're doing. 
They are laughing at me. They're pointing at me. You can't hear anything because of the wind. I'm screaming. I'm green. I'm freaking out. And they're like, it's time to go, Lane. It's your turn. Here's, here's the next step. It's not like Hollywood where you just run and jump. This is a static line jump, which means there's a cable that is hooked to your parachute. And when you leave the airplane, it will open your parachute. Because people like me would go into a fetal position and get tangled up into the cable, they won't let you jump out of the plane. So I have to step out of the plane, grab the wing. See, the, the wing is over here. The wing strut is here. That's how you stepped into the plane, right? I got to step out. So, so here we go. I grab the strut of the wing. And then I let, let my foot off, and then I have to hang from the wing. Here's a picture. This is, what it, this is not me, though. This is what it looks like. <laughs> that guy's obviously done this before. You see the static line? He's hanging from the wing. This is exactly what I was doing. The only reason I went out there was male chauvinistic pride. I was telling myself, if she could do it, I could do it. If she could do it, I could do it. If she could do it, I could do it. Total pride. I am in deep sin right now. Like, I am in deep sin before I'm about to die. <laughs> Therefore, excuse number four, I'm not good enough. I start repenting as I'm hanging from the, the airplane. <laughs> Jesus, forgive me! <laughs> forgive me for looking at that guy wrong in traffic yesterday. I'm like, every sin is just running through my mind. I'm hanging from the wing. Wind in my face. <laughs> the movies... In this situation would de depict this, your hands would begin to slip, right? That's what the movie, any, if you're on a cliff or a wire or the edge of a building, your hands start to slip. What I realize is that's, that's not true at all. I'm holding onto that wing and these hands of flesh, bone, tendon, and muscle turned into titanium. <laughs> I'm locked on. I can hang here until they run this thing out of gas. So I start screaming. See, I can't get back in because the step is about here. So I can't get back in. I start screaming, land the plane! Land the plane! I don't care if you drag my legs off on the runway. Land this thing! Well, the jump master, the guy that's in charge of all of us living... He knows the plane is traveling at a high rate of speed. And so everybody in the plane is laughing, but he's not laughing. And so he starts basically this motion right here. He's going to step on my hands. Because if I don't let go, when he tells me to let go, I end up in the next county and they can't find me. So I realize I'm going to have to let go of this plane. I'm nervous talking about this. This was 20-something years ago. This is, I am so freaked out, I can't even explain it to you. So finally, I'm like, if she can do it, I can do it. I repented of all my sins. Jesus, I'll see you in a second. And I, and I let go of the wing. And the plane just disappears. And I'm falling. And I'm falling. And I'm falling. And I'm like, they forgot to hook me to the plane. There's no shoot. I don't remember what to do. They say that you die before you hit the ground. I don't know if that's true, and I don't know if I was dying, but everything was going black. I was so afraid, like my vision was closing in, it was going black, and I've heard this before, I never experienced until this moment, and I haven't since, but I, my life did flash before my eyes. Here's why I know that, because I remember vividly, for some reason, seeing my mom in like a bathrobe at our Christmas tree with my sister on a tricycle. I'm, my sister's like 20 years old by this point. Like, like that was my life flashing before my eyes. Everything was closing in. I think I'm, I'm, it's over, because I don't remember what to pull. I, I am completely lost, falling from the sky, freaked out, passing out, having a heart attack. I don't know. Poof! The parachute opens. Those of you that are nervous, I'm actually here. See, I lived. Okay. <laughs> I can see some of you are like, did he make it? Did he make it? Yes, I made it. So in one of the videos, I don't know which one, they explain to you that it takes three seconds for your parachute to open. 
What they failed to explain to you is how long three seconds is when you're falling out of the sky. You can think of a lot of things in three seconds. I mean, I, 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 maybe I fell 100 feet, I don't know, but it felt like a lifetime. Well, the parachute opens and worship begins. <laughs> thank you, Jesus! Oh, thank you, Jesus! Oh, thank you, Jesus! I mean, worship like I've never worshiped. <laughs> Everything calms down. The parachute, thank God, is good because I really don't know what I would do if something was wrong with it. And so I, now it's just me and God, 10,000 feet above the ground in eastern Colorado. I'm looking at the snow-capped Rocky Mountains to the west. All there is is this light breeze and the, a little flutter of the parachute above me. It was miraculous. It was the most amazing moment. But here's what I'm telling you. Fear, lack of talent, lack of training, I'm not worthy, could have kept me from that experience. Those excuses can keep you from the experience that God has for you. For some of you, that is merely a relationship with him. You've never given him your life. You've never jumped out of the plane or out of the boat, even with your faith at all. You've never given Jesus that kind of role in your life, and you're missing out on the greatest thing you could ever experience because of some excuses. And those of you do that, that do have a relationship with Jesus, you're missing out on being a minister and a messenger and an ambassador. And you're making excuses that are holding you back, paralyzed to this place where you are. And God is calling you for more. And so very quickly, I want to give you some action steps. Lane, what do I do then? How do I jump out of the plane? How do I step out of the boat? How do I experience what Peter experienced, what you experienced? Because see here, church, let me tell you, I feel like I'm flying. This tow truck driver getting to do ministry blows my mind. And it's not because of talent or training. It's not because I'm good. It's because he's good. And honestly, it's really because I was willing to jump. That's it. Just willing to jump. So number one, here, here's how we do this. Number one, and if you want to title this message, this is my title for this message. Realize if you're not ready, you're perfect. You feel some fear, you're perfect. You feel like you're not prepared, you're perfect. You don't have the talent, you're perfect. You don't have the training, you're perfect. You don't feel worthy, you're perfect. You're exactly who God is looking for. If God would have looked for the people that had all the confidence, he would have gone to the religious leaders. Instead, he went to the normal people like you and me and found some people that were willing to just jump and go with him and, and not rely on their own ability, but rely on his ability. In Matthew 16, 18 is where Jesus prophesied to Peter, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. It wasn't that he built literally the physical church on him, but Peter preached the first message after Jesus went into heaven. The scriptures tell us that thousands of people got saved in that moment. It's the same guy that Jesus called Satan, the same guy that, that made mistakes after mistake. And, and, it, and it, just, it just goes to show us, I think God is talking to us tonight, saying, you know what, if I, would, if I could use Peter, I can use you. As I was forced out of that plane, if she could do it, I could do it. Here's what God is saying to you today. If Peter can do it, I can do it. You need to have that kind of confidence. If Peter can jump, I can jump. Number two, respond to what he's calling you to do. Your jump out of the boat could be giving your life to Jesus for the first time tonight. Your jump out of the boat could be going to the growth track for the first time tonight. Oh, I'm tired of hearing about the growth track. I'm just tired of hearing about it. I feel, feel guilty. And I, well, maybe you ought to just go. Maybe that's, maybe that's that next leap that's going to help you discover your purpose and help you realize that God can use you just as you are. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe your jump out of the boat is to go to your first small group. Oh, I went to a small group once. It was weird. Well, I got a bad haircut once. That didn't stop me from going. I just went to another salon. Go find another small group. 
We did a scientific study here. Actually, I did it. You don't even know about this. Scientific study of our small groups at Impact. 8.67% of our small groups, you don't want to be at them. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> like that just means it's not going to be a fit for you. And that's okay. Just go to another small group. Just go find that place. Well, I went to two of them and I didn't really connect. Well, go to a third one. Go to a fourth one. Maybe that is your leap out of the boat because we can't do this alone. God never intended for us to do it alone. Some of you are in small groups and you're loving it. And your leap out of the boat is it's time for you to lead a small group. Oh, Lane, I, I can't do that. And then the excuses come. The whole Doritos thing and, and the training thing and the I don't have what it takes and those are excuses. Just jump out and see what God does. I'm just telling you. Whatever that thing is that he's calling you to do, you need to respond to that. If it feels scary, if you feel unprepared, if you feel like you're not ready, you're perfect. And then lastly, just jump. It might take your breath away to show up at the growth track. I, I understand that. It took my breath away to go to that bus on Wednesday nights and, and, and try to lead students when I was barely older than any of them. It took my breath away week after week, terrified. But it takes that, that jump. Don't hesitate. Don't doubt. Don't look at yourself. Look at Jesus. See, that's what allowed Peter to walk on water was where his focus was. It wasn't his talent or ability or training. It was where his focus was. And see, if we'll focus on Jesus, we will do some great things for his kingdom. When we focus on us, we're going to sink. Or maybe worse yet, we're going to be stalemated and just stuck right where we are, where we've always been, listening to another sermon, singing another worship set, not experiencing all that God has for us. So my prayer for you, Impact, every single one of you, is that you would have the faith and the courage to just jump wherever you are, whatever that is for you. It's different for every one of us. I pray that you would jump in Jesus' name. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all over the room? And I want to pray for two groups of people. First of all, I want to pray for those of you that have never jumped out of the boat of your own control. You call yourself a Christian. You even believe in God and you maybe throw a prayer up here and there. Maybe you read your Bible from time to time. You go to church, but you've held control. You've stayed in the boat. You've never took a leap of faith and given Jesus your life. And I mean really give it to him. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus describes the scene of heaven where some men show up and they say, Lord, Lord, we, we called you Lord. We cast out demons in your name. And he says, turn away from me because I never knew you. So they were doing all the right motions, but they didn't have the right relationship. And so we need to put ourselves in a place tonight if you've never given yourself fully to that relationship or maybe you had that relationship long ago and you remember when Jesus was in control and when he was really your Lord and when you were really in relationship with him. But like a long lost high school buddy, it is so distant and you know you need to come back. So whether it's for the first time or whether it's coming back to Jesus tonight, if you know you need to leap out of the boat of your own control and give your life to Jesus and get right with Jesus tonight, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer tonight. I'm not going to call anyone forward. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I'm not going to, I'm going to ask you to do anything other than move your faith. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if, if that's you, I want to lead you in a simple prayer silently right where you are. So I'm not, nobody's going to know this is between you and God. That first leap between you and God, you need to make that leap with a movement a physical movement of just lifting your hand. If that's you, just lift your hand up all over the room right now. You're ready to get right with Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Over in the back, in the back corner. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. I can't see every hand. It's not for me to see. It's for God to see it. Four of you right together. Way to go. It's awesome. You can put your hands back down. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm going to just lead you in a simple prayer of surrender and relationship end of jumping so those that lifted your hands you can just pray this silently right where you are if you want to whisper it you can 
You say, Lord Jesus, I'm ready to jump. I give you my life. I relinquish control. I make you my Lord. I accept what you did on the cross when you died and paid for my sins. I ask you to forgive me for living my life without you. I ask you to make me a new person, a new creation. I thank you that the old is gone and the new has come. I thank you you don't count my sins against me. I give you the rest of my life in Jesus' name. Now I want to pray for all of us because I know the enemy comes with excuses from Bishop Davis and Pastor April through the staff through every dream teamer every one of us are faced with excuses the enemy will will strike us with fear and try to stop us in our tracks and so God I just pray against every evil scheme of the devil that his lies would have to fall short at the foot of the cross, that his lies would have to fall short at your word that says you don't count our sins against us, at your word that says we are ministers, we are messengers, we are ambassadors. And I pray that confidence over every single person here. God, I pray that we would have the boldness to take that leap of faith that we need to take, those that, that need to get in a small group, those that need to get on the growth track and get on the dream team. Whatever they're afraid of right now, God, I pray that you would speak it into them right now, that they would be able to conquer that fear and stand on their faith and walk with you and see you do great things. I pray for that confidence, God. God, I thank you for being willing to use unworthy vessels unschooled ordinary people to do great things so God I pray that when we feel unqualified that we would be reminded that Peter and John were unqualified as well and if they can do it we can do it in Jesus name in Jesus name could we stand up and give God our worship let's just thank him and love him and appreciate him and glorify him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.